we've now seen a couple ways that cock tactics can implement the same kind of mental reasoning that we humans do in proofs. We've seen intros for uh, instantiating and saying, well, let this be an arbitrary uh, variable that is a natural number, for example. Uh, we've seen rewrite, which lets us use the notion of Leibniz equality to replace equals for equals inside of a goal. Another way that we humans reason is by case analysis, by saying, well, this quantity could be one of these things, and let me finish off the proof in a different way, potentially, for each one of the things it could be. Okay, here's an example of that in Koch. Suppose we were trying to prove that n plus 1 compared to 0 for equality, and notice that that is the eek b comparison there. We're doing a computation to try to say whether that is true or false. That should be equal to false. That's what we're trying to prove here. Can we prove it? I'll add in those parentheses there just in case it's a little hard to parse that formula at the, at the beginning. Okay, so should n plus 1 ever be equal to 0? Let's just think about that mentally to begin with. Uh, of course not, uh, because we're dealing with natural numbers, and so the smallest n could be is 0. Therefore, the smallest n plus 1 could be would be 1, and 1 is never going to be equal to 0, so that entire side should reduce to false. And of course, false should be equal to false. Something is always equal to itself. That's reflexivity. Well, let's give it a try. We can start the proof. We can introduce n, as we've been doing all along. Um, OK, now I'd like to, like, I don't know, can I simplify that equality there? I could try simple. That's not going to do anything there, though. Well, let's abort that proof for now. So abort is a vernacular command that says, I am done trying to prove this. Forget about it. Uh, it's as if we never tried. It turns out what I really need to do to succeed in this proof with Koch is to do case analysis. I need to examine whether n is 0 here or n is not 0 here. That's going to get me far enough along to be able to simplify it and, and use the tactics that we know already. So uh, let's try to prove this again. I will introduce n. I want to do a case analysis. The syntax for that, for the tactic that we're going to use, which is the destruct tactic, is a little bit impenetrable at first, but we'll make our way through it. Let me start off by simplifying just a little bit and saying simply destruct n. That's really the basic that we're doing for a case analysis here. Uh, that produces two cases. Uh, now let's, let's back up a little bit. Notice that I'm trying to prove n plus 1 equals 0, or eek b 0. And I have one subgoal. After the destruct n, I have two subgoals, one corresponding to when n was the, uh, 0, the O constructor from the definition of the inductive data type for NAT, the other corresponding to the other constructor for the data type NAT, the S constructor, so where it was the successor of something else. Now here, we're reusing the name n. Koch did that by default. Uh, and that is why we maybe don't want to just do a direct destruct here. Instead, let's use this piece of syntax, which actually lets us choose the name of the variables carried along, which are the data carried along by the constructor. Okay, so think of this as the names we need to use for the uh, constructors of the NAT type for the data they carry along. That's that inner natural number for the successor constructor. It's as if, in a way, you could think of it as like, well, there's O here and successor here, and I'm saying what name I want to use for the data carried along here, kind of like I would in a pattern match. It's just we leave off the constructor names. They're not present. Uh, and of course, therefore, they have to be listed here in the same order that they were in the original definition of the inductive data type. OK. So there's no variable to name here because the O constructor doesn't carry anything with it. There's a vertical bar because there's another constructor out to that. And I'm going to call the data carried along by S n prime. Okay, now if I compile that, you can see it makes maybe a little more sense now. Right, I've replaced n with O with 0 here, and I've replaced it with successor of n prime here. Let me back up and do that again. I have n down here right now, but when I do the destruct, I after that, have two cases, one where n is replaced by 0, and one where n is replaced by the successor of n prime. Okay, So those are the two cases that I want to then do a case analysis on and figure out the rest of the proof from there. The one other piece of syntax that I can add in here uh, is 
EQN colon, so that's like a keyword part of this. It's, it says, I want to introduce an equation to record um, what case analysis is being done here. And I want to name that equation E. So let's look at the equation E that results. Here we're in the case where N equals zero. So that's the piece of the case analysis we're in. Uh, later on, the other equation will show that it's the successor of N prime. We'll see that in a second. Okay, for that first piece of the case analysis, I'm going to dive into that uh, with this like bullet mark here. It's a dash. So this is something that allows you to focus in on one piece of a proof in Coq. Right. So I've got, if I make this window a little bigger here, perhaps, uh, I've got two sub goals. Coq only shows me the hypotheses for the first sub goal. Uh, if there were other sub goals down here, there'd be like sub goal three, four, five down there below. Um, we only have two in this case. And I only get to see the full, full proof context for that first sub goal as I'm working on it. But when I focus in on that sub goal with the bullet here and compile past that, notice that all the other sub goals go away. So this is a way as a human, you can focus your attention a little bit, especially if you've got a really big proof going on, this kind of visual uh, clutter removal can be useful. Uh, the other thing is, as we'll, we'll see once we compile this reflexivity to prove it, uh, once we finish it, we now get a little bit of proof organization going on here. Cox says, OK, you've finished that subproof, but you've got other goals that still need to be done. You can now focus on the next one with a with another bullet. Uh, this can keep you from making mistakes where you like think you are moving on to another bullet but haven't or vice versa. Um, that kind of imposed structure is very nice. Uh, it wasn't always something that uh, existed in Coq and was added in and has really improved the organization of proofs in these vernacular files. Okay, so uh, going back up to here, we're doing this case where n is zero. You can see that recorded as an assumption named e in the in the context here, uh, and we've already instantiated n with zero down here below when the when the destruct tactic ran. It did that, and we're trying to prove that if you add zero and one together, is that equal to zero? Should be false. Well, let's see. Let me think through it in my head. Zero plus one should simplify to one. If I compare with the eq b operator one and zero, I should get the boolean false. And of course, I'd be able to prove that false equals false with reflexivity. So that's exactly what's going to go on. I could do the little steps of it there if I do simple first to get false equals false and then reflexivity. But of course, we know reflexivity can handle that on its own. OK, so we're done with that sub goal. Now we can focus in on the next one. Hmm. Well, let's see. We've got successor of something plus one. Uh, how does that simplify? Let's find out. No, that simplifies just to false. You might, in fact, remember based on the definitions of plus and eq b, that's exactly what the pattern matching says. That successor is going to end up on the outside because of that plus. And if you've got a successor on the left hand and a zero on the right hand, eq b is always going to say false. So simple succeeds there, or we could just rely on reflexivity to do it. QED, done with that proof. OK, uh, let's make this a little bigger again so we can see it. So the bullets there were useful to provide proof organization. Uh, you could prove um, by case analysis, though, not just on natural numbers, but on other inductive data types. In fact, case analysis makes sense for any inductive data type because you could have a case for each of the constructors of that data type. Uh, here's an example of that with Booleans. So suppose you wanted to prove that the negation operator on Booleans, neg b, which we defined before, right? that just flips it from true to false or vice versa, you could try to prove that that is an involution or that is involutive. Uh, an involution is an operator where, uh, as, as neg b as an example is here, you apply it twice, you get back to the original thing that you passed in. All right, so if you take b, negate it, negate it again, you've gone a roll around, you're back to b itself. That means it's an involution. OK, so uh, let's do that proof. All right, we're trying to prove that um, for all B0, Cock happened to choose a different name than we chose here. Uh, that's because way up above somewhere we defined a variable already in this namespace named B back when we were like playing around with modules. That's why that happened. Um, you know, it might be nice just to rename that back to B though. So we'll do that with our, our intros here. We're renaming it back to B as part of that introduction. And let's see. Now we want to do a case analysis. We want to destruct B. Uh, there is no additional data carried along by the constructors true or false, right? So we don't need to do anything about choosing names for the values that are buried inside of those constructors. So we're just going to destruct B, and we'll record uh, which piece of the case analysis we're in, once more in an equation that we've chosen the name E for. You could change 
that name to something else if you wanted, right? Now we'd have b equals true, it's named foo here, whatever, doesn't really matter. Uh, e is kind of a, a convention here. Okay, um, let's see. Let's focus in on that first case there. Reflexivity, let's see, that would simplify the neg b true to false, then flip it again to true, so we'd have true equals true. Yeah, reflexivity is good for that. And the same in the other branch. Great. So uh, case analysis, the destruct tactic, totally works for Booleans as well as natural numbers. Let's try another proof by case analysis next. Uh, this one will be a little more complicated. Let's prove that the logical conjunction operation, uh, and b, is commutative, which is to say you can take the and of b and c, and that's going to be the same as taking the and of c with b, right? That you can flip the order of those two arguments. OK, we'll introduce the two variables to start off with, move them above the line. And then let's do a case analysis on b to start off with. Uh, here we'll name our, our uh, equation recording which case we're in uh, eb. And then we're immediately, go, of course, going to do another case analysis on c. So we'll name that one ec. So let's get started. We destruct. We've got two sub goals now, one for where b was true, the other for where b was false. Those, those substitutions have already been made. We'll focus in on the first one where b is true. Now let's do the case analysis on c. So now we have an equation recording that c is true here. And the next one, of course, c will be false down here. We'll see that in a sec. OK, now let's focus in on this first sub goal. So like we've got hierarchical sub goals going on here, right? And the bullets also provide us a hierarchy. So we could use plus after that if we wanted. Uh, you could even uh, use some other bullet if you wanted. For example, uh, dash dash would work there to show that you're in like the next nested sublevel of it. But what you can't do is use dash here, right? Because actually that's the wrong bullet. You haven't finished that first bullet that you've opened there, Cock is telling us. Right? So that's the kind of organization that these bullets can provide. Uh, it is conventional to either use dash dash there or plus as the next level of, of organization. All right, reflexivity finishes that off. We get into the next case where b is true, c is false. Uh, reflexivity is going to work for that. We get into the next top level bullet where b is false, right? Up, up here, b was always true. Now we're into the case where b is false. Uh, we'll do a case analysis on c, and well, you can see where this is going. Reflexivity finishes off each of those cases as well. OK. Uh, another type of bullet you can use is asterisk. And as I mentioned before, you can use repetitions of those to provide sub bullets as well. Another way of doing this instead of those bullets is to use curly braces to provide like blocks of proof script. So let's look at what that appears as. Uh, here's another proof uh, that and b is commutative. We're doing the same uh, proof as we did above. We've just done the destruct on b, but I didn't start off with any bullets. I can open a curly brace to say, all right, now I'm focusing on that first sub goal there. And later on when I'm done, I will close that curly brace. OK, so then I could do that inner destruct, reflexivity, another inner one, reflexivity. All right, so now I've finished that top level sub goal, and I close that brace off to finish it. Okay, so that's another way of providing the same kind of proof organization, showing the human where the organization is, as, also, as well as preventing some mistakes if you tried to like run some tactics thinking you were in the wrong area of the proof. OK. Uh, in software foundations, we more often tend to use bullets when we're doing case analysis like that uh, and reserve braces for other cases, um, which you'll see a little later on uh, with some other tactics. Uh, but from Cox's perspective, it really doesn't matter which way you do it. As one more little helpful thing, uh, sometimes we've been having to do an intros and then immediately a destruct. Uh, like that happened up here, for example, with our proof of and b commutative. It turns out Cock lets you do them together at the same time because it's just such a, such a useful pattern. Uh, so instead of intros followed by a destruct, you can actually collapse uh, them together and you can do the pattern that you would use for the case analysis for the destruct immediately in that place there where you would have just given a name for the thing you were going to destruct on. Okay, let's let's look at that. So suppose we were trying to do this proof again about adding 1 not being 0. Uh, we could do an immediately an intros on n. Oops, my goals window has not refreshed in a while here. Let's get that back. OK. Uh, instead of just doing an intros on n, what I'm doing here is saying I'm going to introduce a natural number, but immediately pattern match, uh, sorry, immediately destruct on it. Uh, and I'll have a case for 0 and a case for successor. And in the case for successor, uh, here I'm going to use n 
as the data carried along. OK, so compile that. And indeed, I get a case where I've replaced n by 0 here, and a case where I've replaced it by successor of n. And the reason n is there is because I named it as part of this, uh, what is called an intros pattern here. OK, I could have chosen k, and then I would have gotten k down here below if I wanted it that way. What's missing from the destruct there is I don't have the equation along with it, right? So if I did tried to do that, Koch would say, no, you can't really do that there. OK, so if you really want that equation recording where you are in the proof in that, in that case analysis, you've got to do the destruct form of it. OK, but intros works just fine here. And we, we can finish off each branch of the proof with reflexivity. There's nothing else that changes like that. OK, um, in cases, by the way, where there is no name to give to the data carried along by the constructor, uh, you can just use empty square brackets. So for example, when we did the proof of and be commutative, let's go back up here to look at that. Um, really, what we were doing is, in a way, constructing a truth table. Right? We're doing the case analysis to say, well, what happens when b is true and c is true, b is true and c is false, and so forth. OK, instead of that kind of verbose way of doing it, where we had multiple destructs going on, we could instead immediately do the destruct as part of the intros here. Uh, but there's no name to give to anything carried along by the true constructor. It doesn't carry anything. Same for false. So we could write empty square brackets, empty square brackets. And that's where we're doing the destruct on B. That's where we're doing the destruct on C. And now, if you scan through the sub goals, you can see you've got the true, 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 false, false, true, false, false cases. So it's like we've constructed, in a way, the truth table right there. And then every single one of those will finish off with reflexivity. That's nice, quick, done.